Hello, welcome everyone um, to the Tough Sustainability Industry Night. Um, my name is Malaika Silcott, and um, it's a pleasure of those of you who are able to join us today. Um, up on the screen right now is a description of what sustainability means um, at Tufts. And so as determined by the Tufts Sustainability Council, the definition of sustainability involves meeting the needs of the present while enhancing the ability of future generations to meet their needs in a just and equitable manner. So thank you all on behalf of me and the Tufts Career Center um, joining us tonight. Um, we wouldn't be able to make this event possible without a lot of the help of the community at large at Tufts. Um, joining me today is Sue Atkins, who will be moderating the, chat, moderating the chat. So if you have any questions or concerns, you can feel free to direct message her in the chat. We'll um, show you the panelists in a second. Um, Department of Environmental Studies was very helpful in giving us the names of some of our presenters today in the networking portion, as well as in um, the first part of today's panel. And then last but not least, a special thank you to the Office of Sustainability, um, who is joining us today. Um, and we're very grateful for um, Tina Wollston, who was able to suggest uh, quite a few names of organizations um, that should be part of tonight's talk. Um, the program agenda for tonight is we are going to be um, giving you a brief introduction of the four speakers we have for the main panel. And again, my name is Malaika Silcott. I'm an assistant director for the Career Center. Um, and then we're going to move at 645 into the open networking session. And Sue Atkins, who will be moderating the chat, uh, will be letting us know how that works shortly close to that time. Our main panelists today for the first part, um, joining us is Killian Madden. Um, she is a technical project manager for Tesla and graduated from the School of Engineering in 2015. Our next panelist is Chrisonia Wong. She is account director at Teak Media and Communications um, here in Massachusetts. And Lieutenant Megan Mahoney, she graduated from Tufts in 2017, and she's a prevention officer and Marine inspector for the US Coast Guard. And then last but not least, um, our most recent graduate, Mike Wilkinson, um, who um, I'm hearing just accepted or just recently uh, switched jobs. And he is a graduate of the class of 2021. And he currently serves as a senior financial analyst for the US Department of Energy and the Loan Programming Office. So thank you all. Um, for joining us today. Um, for those of you who are um, in the audience as students, um, you may want to turn your uh, Zoom on speaker view so that you can hear a little bit more uh, from our panelists today. Um, if you did register in advance for this session, uh, we made note of some of the questions and we're hoping to kind of um, incorporate those into the talk. But if again, if you have any questions for us today, uh, feel free to direct message Sue Atkins when you look through the participant list. So I'm gonna start um, with the first question and any of our four panelists, uh, Megan, Killian, Mike, uh, or Chrisonia can start. Um, would you mind giving us an overview of you, your role, and what sustainability means to you. So anyone can go first or I can pick someone. Uh, I don't mind going first. Okay. So sustainability for the Coast Guard is, you know, a multidisciplinary uh, integration of, of our missions, um, environmental and economic considerations. For me personally, I look at it not just environmental, but you have your social and yes, your economic as well. Um, for the Coast Guard, we're the nation's maritime first responder. And a main portion of our mission has to deal with the maritime transportation system. And um, for those of you that might not be aware, uh, it definitely touches every single one of us, whether you're located near lake or I'm sorry, water or not. 
So the MTS pretty much touches virtually every aspect of American life from the clothes you have on your back, to the food you have on your table, to uh, the natural gas and oil that you're used to heat and, and uh, cool your homes with. So for sustainability for the Coast Guard, we have to make sure that we, we keep our waterways able to be transported on by all different types of vessels. Um, we keep them uh, free of any type of invasive species. And then we also uh, make sure that we keep them free of pollutants as well. So we're, we're the main oversight regulatory authority for that. Um, and then one of the other sustainability pieces is uh, climate change, right? So for um, the Coast Guard, we have a strategic sustainability plan right now that was developed and published in regards to the Arctic. So we're looking at um, the Arctic becoming one of the competitive areas for commerce, for a national security um, that we have to kind of keep an eye on to make sure that our nation is first and foremost secure. So we do have 11 operational missions, marine safety, marine resources, environmental protection, and ice operations are definitely some of them that I think filter into sustainability. Great. Thank you for that um, overview. Chrisonia, do you want to go next? Yes, I can go next. Um, hi, I'm Chrisonia Wong. I'm an accountant director here at Teak Media and Communication. So at Teak, we're a PR agency that focuses on socially responsible companies and nonprofits. So our, you know, my job and the job of my firm is to get out the good news that our clients are doing. Um, and so that can be whether it's getting them a a media hit in like a regional, national, or industry publication, as well as securing them award opportunities, getting them at, in front of speak like uh, speaking opportunities in front of conferences, um, and also helping them strategize with their social media presence. So in my role, I lead media relations and social strategy, but I also help secure new business at my company. So helping um, my agency grow and then also managing relationships with um, our clients. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. And then should I describe what sustainability means or am I getting ahead of myself? Okay. <laughs> what, what does sustainability mean to you individually? Yes. Okay. Um, um, so for me, I would say sustainability means creating a better future, whether it's for ourselves, our earth, um, but also future generations. So whether that's through environmental action or addressing the brokenness in our social system so that um, we can help under-resourced communities, um, because those are the ones who are more, most disproportionately um, impacted by the climate crisis. So yeah, I would guess, I guess it would mean both the environmental aspect, aspect but also the social aspect. Great, thank you. Um, Mike Wilkinson, do you wanna go next? Thank you so much everybody for joining tonight. Really excited to be here and um, talk with some tough students. I always enjoy talking to tough students. Um, as uh, was mentioned, my name is Mike Wilkinson. I'm working with the US Department of Energy in their loan programs office. Um, helping to accelerate innovation in the clean energy economy, um, trying to essentially commercialize uh, technologies that will um, have a significant impact on reducing emissions within the energy sector, as well as a variety of other sectors. And previous to this role, I was working at Goldman Sachs in their renewable power group, focusing on developing and uh, constructing, operating solar battery storage projects uh, across the country. Um, graduated from Tufts in 2021. So um, again, excited to be here. In terms of my uh, sustainability definition, to me, sustainability is one of our highest ideals. Um, it's a framework that draws on concepts within the circularity and resource management movements, but it broadly spans environmental, economic, and social spheres. Circularity, for anyone who hasn't heard of that concept, um, essentially implies that a product that is created needs to take its own end of life into account, um, as well as its start of life. Um, obviously, I'm talking about a product here, but these kinds of concepts apply, um, as I said, 
environmentally, economically, and socially. So a product, a process, um, an idea, all of those can be evaluated in a sustainability framework. Um, but in a circular economy, once the user is finished with a product, it goes back into the supply chain instead of a landfill. Um, the model, the motto of a circularity movement is essentially waste not, want not. Um, circularity focuses on resource cycles, sustainability more broadly um, to me relates to people, the planet, the economy. Um, and of course, there's the commonly recognized environmental sustainability, um, but often overlooked uh, in the mainstream media, I would say, are the social and economic components of sustainability, um, which of course bring into focus uh, diversity, justice, equity, inclusion, critical concepts that um, you know we need to make sure are integrated in sustainability frameworks. Um, I'll also say, and then I'll, I'll pause, is that it's rare to find uh, an entirely or truly, quote, sustainable product, process, method, or practice. We have to be skeptical um, in the face of corporate, political, social, governmental forces that try to employ that term leniently because greenwashing uh, is very rampant in the sustainability, quote, industry or, or world. So thank you for that overview from your perspective as well um, as your opinion. Um, so our last panelist is, uh, or last panelist to talk about what sustainability means uh, to them is Killian Madden. Um, obviously, when you if you're driving or you're walking, you could recognize a Tesla, um, and she comes to us as a project manager from Tesla. So Killian, can you give an overview of what you do as a project manager, and also what does sustainability mean to you? Sure. First, it's great to be here tonight. This is a fantastic event. I love my time at Tufts because of events like this and happy to, to share in this way. Uh, Tesla's mission is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Most notable are the electric vehicles. I've never owned a car. I'm in it for the energy aspect, um, which is one of the many facets of sustainability, one that we need critically. Um, and so my job is to get as many rooftop solar systems, that's the solar roof system, that's the solar panel system and home battery systems into as many customer homes as possible in a way that's economic for the customer, that makes sense for us and that makes technological sense. I'm not out there to just plaster every surface with solar. It has to you know, be sunny and make sense to, to put solar there. Uh, a lot of, lot of factors involved with that, but Ultimately, the more that we're able to get out there that's productive for the customer will provide a lifelong benefit to that customer. To me, sustainability is that net benefit over the life of the product that includes the process, all the partnerships that interact with that product and process. And it's really important that we recognize there are negative benefits. There's drawbacks to a lot of things that we put out into this world but if it's net positive, I think that's a step in the right direction for sustainability. Mm -hmm. We have to have that because if it's any sort of net negative, then that, that's not sustainable. Great. So my next question, um, we talked about how you, you know, what your role is um, in helping your organization to conduct sustainable efforts. Can one of the panelists or two of the panelists talk about what are some of the issues that you feel are impacting your company or you feel like is impacting the sustainability industry? What's impacting your ability to kind of create results, if, if at all? Um, I'm happy to start because I don't think it'll take too long, but I think Mike already alluded to this earlier, but a lot of my clients are afraid to talk about what they do in sustainability um, just because they're afraid of being accused of greenwashing. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a very real and a very valid fear. Um, but I think, you know, in case anyone's wondering what my opinion is on that, um, I think that <laughs> that um, you perfect, there's probably nothing like more applicable to this topic than the, the um, saying perfect is the enemy of good. 
I think that sometimes when we act only in fear, we don't say anything at all. And I do think businesses, um, organizations, they all have a really important role in our society of, you know, I guess creating, um, like influencing people to want more sustainable options. Um, and so while we're not gonna get it all right and we're, we don't have it, you know, we don't have all the answers just yet. I think that by acknowledging what you are doing, um, that's right. And then also acknowledging what you don't know. I think when you act um, more because you have a clear conscience and less because you're fearful of something, I think that's when you yield the best results. So anywho, just to double check or gut check that, I do think greenwashing is the number one issue, especially when it comes to the communications. Um, and I think that it's just about speaking honestly, transparently, and admitting what you don't know and what you do know. Thank you. And that was one of the questions that had come up from students as well. Um, you know, in your efforts, how do you avoid greenwashing um, at your organizations? Oh, Did it? yeah, you I'd like a comment. Yeah, Megan. Um, I was going to take a crack at both questions. Sure. So. <laughs> Um, so uh, the Coast Guard has come out with um, a climate community of interest and, and also a policy on sustainability, energy, and environmental readiness. So we're trying to make sure that as an organization ourselves, a lot of people are saying, wait, I thought you were military. Yes, we are, but we also look at ourselves as an organization as well. And we want to make sure that we are putting our best foot forward for the planet and for our future generations. And so with that initiative um, and with this climate community of interest working group, we are finding ways to, to make sure that we are bringing renewable energy to our footprints and our shore infrastructures, as well as to our vessels. And then um, one of the challenges that we see with uh, sustainability in the future, with uh, environmental protection is we've been working with uh, the International Maritime Organization for decades now, and we've been implementing regulations, but that is a very, very slow process. So not only is trying to create new laws painful to do at times because you're sometimes working against um, organizations like oil and gas, where they don't really want to be overly regulated. Um, you also have to work with companies that might not have the budget to make the changes that need to be made, um, for instance, air emissions. So those are some of the challenges that we face doing our job in the marine safety part of, of uh, our 11 missions, and the one that I mainly deal with. Anyone else like to comment on that? I can also move to the next question. I'll comment. These are not, this is not an easy problem, problems to solve. These are large complex systems that are pervasive in globally and people's lifestyles. So to make these changes, really have to shake things up. And that causes a lot of friction, which is a barrier to, to doing what we really wanna do. Mm -hmm. uh, so leave that there. Okay. So um, the next question um, that kind of came out, there was quite a few that came out from students is it was really hard to define what sustainability is. And for those of you students that are on the call, um, there is a PDF um, on the Handshake event page that shows you all the different organizations that are gonna be involved in the networking portion. And you'll see that even among our panelists, um, the, one, the organizations that wanted to be part of our discussion today include small organizations, state organizations, federal organizations, private organizations, um, all different areas. We have media, um, so, you know, so really take note of that. Um, so for our panelists today um, who have chosen these roles where they feel like they are doing good, they are trying to you know, um, understand the, as what Mike said, the circularity or uh, um, figuring out how to make sure that we don't create all these um, products and, and have them have more of a lifespan <laughs> um, than most things are. Um, what kinds of, technical skills do you feel are most important in your role? And is there things that students can be learning right now um, in their classrooms for your industry or in work towards sustainability? I 
I can go. Um, mm -hmm. If you hear me, my name is Florian. By the way, uh, uh, I'm run or I'm part of a family business. Uh, we sell recycling machinery. So when you throw away your aluminum can or your glass bottle or your paper, your cardboard, um, it goes to a machine that separates that all, and then we compress that, and then our clients sell that for a profit. Um, so when you throw something away in New York, Minneapolis, and Chicago, and Los Angeles, it goes to one of our machines most likely. Um, so so we're always big on circular economy, making sure that we all like you know get that get that going. In terms of like what you can do now you know i also saw a question about like what you can major in like in the end a lot of stuff that i do with is like communication i'm dealing with municipalities in new york city we're trying to install underground waste storage containers that store that stuff or just talking to clients and talking to crane companies and just talking to all these different organizations um a class i took at tufts which i didn't think would help me so much was actually public speaking in any job that you're going to be doing you have to end up talking to people and you have to communicate and you have to verbalize a lot of the stuff you have to meet face to face it doesn't happen over an email um and so honestly whatever you're going to end up doing whether it's a sustainability or not obviously we hope that it is um you're going to have to work with a lot of different parts a lot of different pieces of the puzzle need to come together and and something i'll just was talking about earlier about what can be hard about this stuff is that it takes a lot of time a lot of times when you're working with government organizations or you're working within your own organizations, this stuff really doesn't happen overnight. So you also have to have patience, right? And you just have to just let it play out and eventually that it will. And eventually, you know, as, as, as in our business, you know, we sell this machinery, it gets set up in a city, they take in your trash and they then sell that and that gets turned into something new, right? So it does happen, but these projects, at least what, what I deal with, right? They took nine months to put together probably another nine months in front of that to, to work out all the sales deals and stuff like that. So it's two years until something's actually getting processed. So be patient, learn how to communicate and, and understand that like it will come, it will come. Great. Thank you, Florian, for adding that. Um, so my next uh, question, and this is more geared towards um, the, the, the four panelists in uh, the first part. Um, can any of you describe your individual process for finding uh, roles when you first left Tufts or even while you're at Tufts that helped you understand more about what sustainability is um, and that reflected your values? Can you talk a little bit about how you were able to figure out a, a career or a job that made an impact on sustainability? I can go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. I would recommend if anybody uh, has an opportunity to get involved with the Office of Sustainability at Tufts, try to attend more events like this, um, try to get connected with um, people on the eco reps, for example, if you're familiar with them. Um, they are you know, really focused on these issues and uh, it's a great place to start. There's a great community uh, in sustainability at Tufts. Um, I started as an eco rep at Tufts, and then I worked at the Office of Sustainability, um, helped work on the carbon neutrality plan for Tufts while I was a student, um, trying to understand, you know, what technologies do does the campus need to incorporate to reduce its carbon footprint, bring it to net zero. Um, that got me thinking about um, the importance of the energy industry in terms of emissions reduction and climate change. Um, at the same time, I was uh, working um, that summer at a nonprofit in Pennsylvania focused on environmental policy, lobbying, advocacy. And then that reinforced the fact that, um, you know, I really wanted to work on environmental issues. I really wanted to work specifically on renewable energy because I felt that that was critical and that is critical um, to our emissions reduction. And then I wanted to work, um, try municipal government. So I worked for the city of Philadelphia, which is my hometown. Um, helping them build out their solar program uh, on a municipal level. Um, so uh, long story short, my process was to try to get involved with sustainability broadly, then try to within sort of the sustainability sphere, understand where I find interest, where I um, feel motivated, where I think I can make an impact. Um, and then, you know, in my post college career, I've been focused really on the energy sector um and from my perspective wherever you're working there needs to be a clear purpose from the top it needs to be clearly communicated why are we here why are we doing this um, why is this important and if those reasons don't resonate with you or if there are no reasons provided then you know you're not in the right place mm -hmm. thank you mike 
Killian, did you have um, any comments that you wanted to add to that or you know, describe your journey towards sustainability as well? Mike had on important points about participation and showing up and doing things. Uh, connections don't just form from internet research, even though we might like them to manifest this way. Mm -hmm. um, I did some volunteering for industry expos, some solar and energy uh, events. And as a student, volunteering was a great way to get involved and meet the people doing the work in that industry. And not only the, the people going to the con cons conference, but the, the different companies that had booths there. And so I found that that continues to be a way to meet people who are doing really interesting work. And whether or not it's about your career, you're still able to form connection with people who have that, that interest and you can learn a lot both ways. So that's something I recommend um, you know, get involved in. Very, very easy to volunteer once, twice, or even on a regular basis. Great, thank you. And Lieutenant Mahoney, um, U.S. Coast Guard, did you know from the beginning that you wanted to join the U.S. Coast Guard? Um, did you grow up near the water? What was, pers what was the value of um, kind of like you becoming interested in, in marine life and, and being close to the water and how that impacts our sustainability efforts? So when I was in high school, actually, um, back in 2003, dating myself, um, I did a paper on uh, pollution response, and that's how I learned first about the Coast Guard having search and rescue and helicopters. Um, and so that's when I decided that I would speak to a recruiter, learn more about the Coast Guard. And I do recommend if you ever want to join the Coast Guard as they're either an active duty member, reservist, or a civilian, because we have a lot of civilian jobs, um, that you first go check out your nearby unit and talk to someone that's more aligned with what you'd want to do, like someone like myself, if you want. Um, but I, I enlisted uh, right out of high school and um, it was I was very fortunate to be selected for a college program that allowed me to attend Tufts. And I attended Tufts through the real program, which is the returning education for adult learners. Um, and and I echo what everyone else had said when I was at Tufts for the, the two years that I was there, I I networked. I went to all these different expos, um, volunteered when I wasn't working. And I could say that I almost considered, is this really what I want for the rest? Or maybe this will be my retirement job because I'm 17 years in and, and I think I might uh, I might transition to another another avenue after this. But yeah, that's my story. So one of the things that um, maybe the panelists and the alum and the organizations don't know in the room is that um, at Tufts, at least among the undergraduates, it's majors month. And so there's a lot of conversations on campus around you majored in that or, you know, surprising because, you know, sometimes I get students that think you have to major in one thing and that's going to, you know, set you for life. Um, so, Chrisonia, you're the only one on the panel that's not from Tufts, but I'm sure that that was a stereotype at your college as well. Um, so can you comment on, you know, you, you mentioned that one of the things that attracted you um, is you like to promote or help, you know, tell, do the storytelling for companies and organizations that are doing well um, and that are, are, are doing good. Um, can you describe a little bit about your choice of major and how you came to be in communications versus field work or versus being in the lab or um, in government work? Okay, um, I can answer the question that you just posed and then also the original one. Um, so I initially wanted to be a doctor and my goal was to just retire early at 40 so I could actually do what I wanted, which was right. Um, and then, you know, it kind of one day it just occurred to me that today or tomorrow is not for, like you can't take that for granted. You're not it's not given to you. And I was just thinking, you know, I don't want to wait for my life to begin at 40 or whenever I thought I was going to retire um, 18 year old me. And so I decided to, to my parents' dismay, to not pursue medicine, um, and I picked journalism. 
and they were like devastated, but I had a great time. I loved my major. I also didn't go to Tufts. Um, I went to the University of Florida, go Gators. Um, but anywho, so I don't even watch sports y'all. Okay. Anywho. So I did journalism. I loved it. And then after graduation, this is a side note, but I ended up just kind of, um, I decided to get married and my husband's from the Boston area. And while I had job opportunities in Florida, no one knew what UF was um, here. So they were just like, what are you doing here? Like, <laughs> you're from the South. I, you're, you know, like, I don't know what, why you're here. And I was just like, good question. Um, and then so I did not get like any journalism job up here because people were like, yeah, you know, we've got Harvard and we have Tufts and we have Northeastern and we have BU and like you're very random and I don't know what UF's about so I was like okay never mind I will not go into journalism um and I took the first job that took me in which was um a PR job it was B2B tech and you know something that I wanted to do with journalism is I really wanted to write but I also wanted to do good with writing like I wanted to make the world a better place um and I knew that having you know contributing to like doing journalism would help um, a functioning democracy. That's how we, you know, get our information and how we make decisions. And B2B tech PR really sucked the life out of me. I did it for two years. And in those two years, I swear I was aging in dog years and it was just horrible. Um, and then, so I thought to myself, well, maybe I can make the world a better place by doing healthcare PR because it's still going to be lucrative, but I can like write and who, you know, it'll be great. And then the pandemic happened and I was doing healthcare PR during a pandemic. And it became very evident to me that I did not love healthcare PR enough to work 16 hour days. Um, and then honestly, I got recruited to do um, nonprofit PR by the company I still work at now. And everything for me changed. And not to say that you have to follow your passion because maybe your passion doesn't have to be your job. But for me, I found that I am very much motivated by the mission. Um, and so that's how I ended up in sustainability. Um, just by one, the doors being closed and just trying to find a way to get back to um, what I wanted to originally do, which was to write and to do it for a good cause. So that's how I'm at my job. And um, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Um, one of the questions also was what, kinds of internships, if I wanted to maybe follow your career path or in your particular industry, was there, um, this can be any of the remaining three, um, was there any particular internships or any jobs that you recommend that people um, look out for if they want to work towards sustainability in your industry? You can even comment on an internship that maybe you had that helped you clarify a little bit of your career goals in that area. Mike? Yeah, sure. I mentioned earlier some of the uh, internships that I did. I think uh, as a thematic point, I would focus on, uh, for me, I'm very interested in public service and um, working in the public sector. Um, so I have a bias here, but um, there's a lot of interesting work that's being done um, that I'm sure you can find that's local to your community. Um, I would I would try to look to see look you know up where you're from or maybe um, you know po popular met metropolitan area near where you're from. See what kinds of opportunities there are um, working in nonprofits or in um, municipal government. Um, I think uh, a lot of there are a lot of nonprofits doing really amazing work and a lot of um, municipalities, even small towns um, that have um, a significant interest in, in adopting sustainability practices um, in a variety of different ways. And so I think if that's your passion, that's a great way to just get exposure. Um, obviously, there's the challenge that we can all relate to, which is the unpaid versus paid issue. Um, but I won't get into that right now. Um, <laughs> I'll just say that I think those are good um, focal points to sort of get exposure to a variety of areas, um, and then you can hone in from there. Again, also get associated with the Office of Sustainability at Tufts if you can. 
Tesla does have a number of internships, number of programs. Some of them are designed for adults, adults returning to work after a hiatus or military fellows returning from duty, but there's also a segment focused at current students. Um, there's ones that are over the summer only or even semester long. Check out the Tesla career site if you're interested. Uh, they're fairly intensive from what I hear, but I'm sure that's a great way to learn, learn a lot. Okay. So next question um, that came from students is, what advice would you give to students on how to build connections with, um, for those of you who went to grad school, um, or just in general, professionals with the field. Sorry, what advice would you give to students on how to build connections um, with professionals in the field? And is that something that helped you along the way? Personia? <laughs> um, I guess I would say, don't be afraid to just read like reach out you know if you see someone who is doing something really cool and you want to know how they got to where they are i'm sure they would love to tell you about it because no one likes it more than when you stroke their ego and say you are super cool how can i be like you so um reach out and then show real curiosity i think that when you are genuine um in your curiosity i think it shows but i think it's a tougher sell when someone is just trying to get something out of you. So make sure that you're showing, you know, real curiosity and don't be afraid to reach out. I have some thoughts on this. Um, yeah. I've spent a lot of time during my time at Tufts uh, fixated on my career and fixated on trying to figure out um, how to find the best opportunity, uh, how to um, even thinking, you know, years in advance, uh, years ahead, like, what do I want to be doing five years from now? And how, what do I need to do every single month, every single day to get myself to that point? I'll just say that I don't think that is a healthy approach. Um, for me, it took a lot away from my experience while I was at Tufts. So take into consideration before I make my following my next statement that you need to enjoy your time while you're there and don't focus too much on your career you're going to have plenty of time to be working. You're going to have 30 plus years to be working most likely. So enjoy your time at Tufts. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, meeting people and trying to make connections, um, I strongly believe that um, trying to make connections needs to be an exchange. It can't be transactional. You have to have some kind of value proposition that you're providing, or you need to, um, you know, even just show, showing genuine interest and enthusiasm, like Chris Oni was talking about. Um, just keep that in mind. And then, also, it requires a lot of persistence and willingness to be vulnerable, willingness to, to talk to people one-on-one, -on -one. put yourself out of your comfort zone, reach out to people, like Chrisonia was saying, talk to people you think are interesting, get yourself a LinkedIn, if you can, um, you'll get uh, a million people, you'll be able to see you know, millions of people you find interesting, and you're going to want to talk to them endlessly um, about what they're doing. Um, those are my tips. I'll pause there. Megan? I mean, I, I think the, the last two kind of hit it right on the head. Um, it's all about networking really um, and getting out there and do your research though, like figure out a couple of different things that you are truly interested in and then find out those people, not just, you know, plug and play people here and there. Um, I think I, I looked at four different career paths before I actually enlisted into the Coast Guard. And then that was my final decision. But um, even now networking as, as I continue moving forward throughout my career, it's one of the best skills that you can have. Right. And Killian, any thoughts on um, networking or people that um, you connected to before you arrived at Tesla that helped you get to where you are? I mentioned volunteering earlier as a great way to meet people, but what's really impactful for networking is recurrence, showing up again and again and really building a long-term relationship with that person that you're that you want to connect with. Events like this are great one time, but it's that follow-up, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's human relationships are are important, surprisingly. And as Chrisonia said, people are very interested in helping. 
Um, but you know, gotta mm -hmm. make that ongoing and have it be an exchange both ways. That's that's very valuable. Mm -hmm. Something I didn't know at Tufts. I did go to some networking events, but what I didn't know was that professional networking is a thing in in the professional world. There are networking groups that meet weekly. They have structured meetings and they track referral points. Um, it's very fascinating to be a part of and also very rewarding. So something maybe not at a student level, but just something to know that is out in the world, that there are those frameworks for you if you're interested in them. Right. So at this point in time, I mean, I do have a few more questions, but all of the panelists are going to be in breakout. So I'd encourage you, if we didn't ask your question, that you um, remember what you asked in the registration or if things come up to you right now, um, make note of that. I'm going to turn it over to Sue Atkins, who's going to explain how the breakout rooms will work. But I'd like to thank all of the panelists um, for the first half that were able to join us today and, and share their comments of how they got to their uh, roles at their organizations and continue to contribute to sustainability efforts. So thank you all. So Sue Atkins, you have yeah. the floor. Thank you so much. I just want to thank Malika and all the speakers on the panel. It was fantastic. Thanks for sharing your insight with students and, and our guests on the Zoom.